thank you for your patience. And uh, we're, we're really in for a treat this evening. I'm Diane Crash, the director of Arlington Public Library. Thank you so much for being here. Several of you, many of you were here uh, a month ago for Jasmine Ward and her really uh, stirring and emotional uh, personal journey. And uh, it was a terrific program. We are in for a huge treat tonight as well. So uh, again, thank you to Kimberly and the Friends of the Library for making programs like these possible. I hope. me for a minute more. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I, I promise I'll be brief. Um, Arlington Television is recording the event tonight. Please turn off your electronic devices. We will show it on Arlington TV uh, many, many, many times for those of you who uh, were here uh, but maybe out in the, in the, uh, in the foyer. We're also going to have a, a Q&A portion. We will probably not do that as lengthily as we typically do, because we really want to get to the book signing and, and honor being able to, to get everyone uh, out uh, at a reasonable time. Arlington Reads is in its 10th year, and we use reading to create community focusing on one issue or theme, which may be in the headlines or may appeal to county residents based on their own lives and experience. Our theme this year is hashtag Black Lives Matter. Thank you very much. As many of you might know, the American Dialect Society also selected that as their word of the year. The hashtag continues to be a familiar sight on both social and traditional media as we continue our struggles with issues of race, justice, and equality from Ferguson and Cleveland to New York and Baltimore and too many locations. And tonight we will hear yet another perspective. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie was born in Nigeria and was on track for a medical degree when she came to the United States in the late 1990s to study communications and politics. She quickly became a published poet, short story writer, and playwright and pursued both a master's in creative writing from John Hopkins and a master's in African studies from Yale. Ms. Adichie was awarded a prestigious MacArthur Genius Grant and in 2010, the New Yorker featured her in its list of the 20 best authors under the age of 40. Her, her first novel, 2003's Purple Hibiscus, was awarded the Commonwealth Writers Prize for Best First Book, and her second, Half a Yellow Sun, about the life of two sisters during the Nigerian Biafran War, won the Orange Prize for Fiction. Tonight, she's here to discuss Americana. In her words, a novel about love, about race, and about hair. <laughs> which was named one of the 10 best books of the year by the New York Times. It also won the 2013 National Book Critics Award and the hearts and minds of all of us here tonight. She has also delivered two riveting tech TED Talks, one of them we should all be feminists. If you haven't seen it, look it up. Many of you know that it went from being a TED Talk to the center of a Beyonce track, Flawless, which I spent the afternoon listening to. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie gives us the ability to see this country through the eyes of a newcomer. As a black African in America, Adichie was confronted for the first time with what it meant to be a person of color in America. Through her unique vantage point, she outs our attitudes on race and lays bare in prose that is comic, candid, and compassionate our discomfort with the subject, a discomfort that sits beneath a veneer of political correctness. In an interview with National Public Radio's Scott Simon, Mrs. Adichie, Mrs. Adichie said about the late, great Nigerian writer, 
Chinue Achibe. And you know, and you know, the best of literature is that you are reading, but you're learning as well, and you're growing. And at the end of it, you feel that you know more about human nature and that there's a sense of just being human that's really wonderful. The same may be said of her. Ladies and gentlemen, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Thank you. So thank you for that very kind introduction. And I have a question for you about Beyonce. <laughs> have you listened to any other songs? <laughs> Good. So I want to say thank you so much for, for just this wonderful, warm welcome. I wasn't quite sure what to expect from Arlington. <laughs> so, so it's just such a lovely feeling. Thank you. Thank you for turning up. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your warmth. Um, I I'm just really happy to be here. I'm, I'm happy to be part of this program. I was reading up about it, and it just sounds really lovely. This is the first time that I, um, I'm feeling a little slow, so I'm going to ask you to forgive me if I, if I seem a little slow and a little out of sorts. I have just, um, uh, my family went through something very traumatic this past weekend. Um, my father was kidnapped on um, Saturday. He's fine. He's been released. Um, he was he was uh, so he was in captivity for three days, and it was just the most awful thing. And he's been released and he's fine. But it it made me think about a lot of things, and it made me think about how. Yeah. But so I'm, I was determined to come because I didn't want to, because my father asked me to come. <laughs> um, but, but you know, it's, been, it's just been a very, really strange time. It's such a horrible thing, hearing that your father's been kidnapped, waiting to hear from the kidnappers, not knowing if he's alive. Waiting, just waiting. It's it's just the most awful thing, and I've I've found myself dealing with, with um, relief that he's fine, but also with an incredible rage, that he was violated in this way. That he's, he's a man. He's 83 years old. He's um, he's a brilliant, kind, simple, gentle man, and to have had his dignity assaulted in this way to for me is unbearable. And so I found myself going through this. I'm so happy that is fine, but I'm so enraged. <laughs> and I also find myself feeling guilty because my father was targeted because he's my father. Um, uh, the kidnappers, um, you know, wanted Chimamanda's father. And so for me, there's just also the sense of, and I know I shouldn't, I know, but, but, but I can't help but feel guilty. All right, I'm so sorry to start at this. <laughs> very dampening <laughs> bit, but um, what I'd like to do actually is spend most of the time doing Q&A. Q, I'd like to hear from you. I, um, I'm assuming most of you have read the novel, so I, I would rather not read from it, just so that I don't bore you to tears. Um, Americana, really? <laughs> <laughs> All right, then, uh, can I, will somebody lend me a book so I don't actually have, can I borrow it? All right, so I'll read. <laughs> you have to remind me to give it back to you because I steal books, so this is the thing. I'm going to read, I'll just read a little bit from the beginning and then, and then we can talk. Princeton, in the summer, smelled of nothing. And although Ifemelu liked the tranquil greenness of the many trees, the clean streets and stately homes, the delicately overpriced shops, and the quiet, abiding air of earned grace. It was this, the lack of a smell, that most appealed to her. Perhaps because the other American cities she knew well had all smelled distinctly, 
Philadelphia had the musty scent of history. New Haven smelled of neglect. Baltimore smelled of brine, and Brooklyn of sun-warmed garbage. But Princeton had no smell. She liked taking deep breaths here. She liked watching the locals who drove with pointed curtsy and parked their latest model cars outside the organic grocery store on Nassau Street, or outside the sushi restaurants, or outside the ice cream shop that had 50 different flavors, including red pepper or outside the post office where effusive staff bounded out to greet them at the entrance. She liked the campus, grave with knowledge, the Gothic buildings with their vine-laced walls, and the way everything transformed in the half-light of night into a ghostly scene. She liked most of all that in this place of affluent ease, she could pretend to be someone else, someone specially admitted into a hallowed American club, someone adorned with certainty. But she did not like that she had to go to Trenton to braid her hair. It was unreasonable to expect a braiding salon in Princeton. The few black locals she had seen were so light-skinned and lank-haired, she could not imagine them wearing braids. And yet, as she waited at Princeton Junction Station for the train, on an afternoon ablaze with heat, she wondered why there was no place where she could braid her hair. The chocolate bar in her handbag had melted. A few other people were waiting on the platform, all of them white and lean, in short, flimsy clothes. The man standing closest to her was eating an ice cream cone. She had always found it a little irresponsible the eating of ice cream cones by grown-up American men. <laughs> Especially the eating of ice cream cones by grown-up American men in public. He turned to her and said, about time, when the train finally creaked in, with that familiarity that strangers adopt with each other after sharing in the disappointment of a public service. She smiled at him. The graying hair on the back of his head was swept forward, a comical arrangement to disguise his bald spot. He had to be an academic, but not in the humanities, or he would be more self-conscious. A firm science like chemistry, maybe. Before, she would have said, I know that peculiar American expression that professed agreement rather than knowledge. And then she would have started a conversation with him to see if he would say something she could use in her blog. People were flattered to be asked about themselves. If they asked what she did, she would say vaguely, I write a lifestyle blog. Because saying I write an anonymous blog called Race Teenth or various observations about American blacks, those formerly known as Negroes, by a non-American black, would make them uncomfortable. <laughs> she had said it, though, a few times. Once, to a dreadlocked white man who sat next to her on the train, his hair like old twine ropes that ended in the blonde fuzz, his tattered shirt worn with enough piety to convince her that he was a social warrior and might make a good guest blogger. Race is totally overhyped. Black people need to get over themselves. It's all about class now, the haves and the have-nots, he told her evenly. And she used it as the opening sentence of a blog post titled, Not All Dreadlocked White American Guys Are Down. <laughs> <laughs> then there was the man from Ohio who was squeezed next to her on a flight. A middle manager, she was sure, from his boxy suit and his contrast color. He wanted to know what she meant by lifestyle blog. And so she told him, expecting him to become reserved or to end the conversation by saying something defensively bland like, the only race that matters is the human race. <laughs> but he said, do you ever write about adoption? Nobody wants black babies in this country. And I don't mean biracial, I mean black. Even the black families don't want them. He told her that he and his wife had adopted a black child and their neighbors looked at them as though they had chosen to become martyrs for a dubious cause. Her blog post about him titled, Badly Dressed White Middle Managers from Ohio Are Not Always What You Think, <laughs> had received the highest number of comments for that month. She still wondered if he had read it. She hoped so. 
Often she would sit in cafes or airports or train stations, watching strangers, imagining their lives, and wondering which of them were likely to have read her blog. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. So I think before, um, before I take the questions, I, I, just to say that, um, in case any of you are wondering, I'm not Ifemelu, the main character in the novel. <laughs> I know that uh, this is a question I have been asked very often. And actually, this is something I have been told by people who've read the book. And, um, and really, depending on my mood, sometimes I say I am her, and other times I say I'm not. <laughs> so today is one of the days when I'm saying I'm not her. And, um, but I think the thing about writing fiction is, you know, it's such a strange, I mean, c clearly all of my characters are me to a certain extent, very much in the way that um, Flaubert is said to have said, Madame Bovary, c'est moi. So in, this, in that way, all of my characters are me, but also all of, none of my characters are me, because one draws from oneself, but also from, from, observation, from observing, from reading, from watching, from listening, and, and also from imagining. Um, so today, female is not me, and, and I'm, now I'm happy to take questions if you, if you have them. Um, where do you get your inspiration for writing? Everywhere. I, I, don't, I, th I don't think of inspiration as something that can be, um, I don't think of it as something that can be explained, really. I, I mean, I, I have a notebook, actually I no longer write in a notebook, now I write in my phone. And I'm just constantly watching the world. I'm constantly watching and I, I, I notice things and I write them down. Sometimes I don't want to forget something. And, and it can be something really random. <laughs> right? it's, it's not necessarily that I observe profound things. It's that uh, the color of a woman's lipstick might strike me. Right? And, um, or at the airport, watching families saying goodbye, the way that you, you know, the way that you, the way that you see love and longing in just in the way people look at each other when they turn to go. Um, and I notice that and sometimes I write something down. And so I think that inspiration, actually I think that the idea of where do you get your inspiration can be quite overrated. Right? Because there are people who um, romanticize it quite a bit. And so there are times actually when I'm tempted to say, you know, my inspiration comes from lighting candles and... <laughs> <laughs> and looking at the full moon <laughs> for an hour. But it's, I, I it, and also it depends, it depends on, it depends on what I'm working on, what I'm thinking about, what's happening in my life at the time, what's happening in the world, you know, what, 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 what calls me. I mean, I, I often say to my family, and, the, and then they'll tell me that I'm a little crazy, um, when I say to them that I don't necessarily choose stories, stories choose me. Sometimes I'm just drawn to something, and, and I suppose, it means inspiration. So I don't have a, I don't have a, a neat answer about where I get my inspiration. Hi, so my question builds on the inspiration. It's more about your personal mantra. Um, what is the belief that you hold about yourself that helps to spur and develop your creativity? Hmm. Very deep. <laughs> What is a belief I hold about myself? Um, see, I'm, I'm always worried about questions that start to seem to me suspiciously like a therapist's questions. <laughs> because, um, and I, I try very hard increasingly not to psychoanalyze myself because there's a sense in which I don't necessarily want to know what my... So people have often asked me, what are the, what are the books that... Um, What's that question writers get all the time? What, what are your, um, so in some ways sort of a way of saying, well, what books do you kind of want to copy, right? <laughs> and I, I don't really, questions of that sort make me uncomfortable because I'm not sure I want to know. You know, I'm not sure I want to, I'm not sure I want to entirely understand what my motivations are and what, what the source of it is because then in some ways I think one would lose something. For me, writing is a discovery. I don't, it's, it, it's that I'm learning as I go on, right? And, and I, and I start off with a certain level of, um, a certain level of self-belief, right? Which, 
really, if you ask me, comes from being raised by my parents <laughs> being, and growing up in my family. And it's also something I didn't even really know I had until people would say to me, why, why do you seem so confident? And I think, oh, I am? Okay, that's kind of nice, but it must be, you know, my parents. So I think it starts off with that level of self-belief, but also just a deep love for... Writing is what makes me happy when it's going well. It's something I deeply, deeply love. And... Um, so that's it. I write because I have to. I can't imagine if I think that I, if I had to live my life without the ability to write, I don't know that I would want to. It's it's that deeply. That's the thing that gives meaning to my life. That and my family, and so I don't know that. Um, yeah, um, just back to your therapist question. I don't know that. <laughs> I don't know that there's a belief I hold necessarily that that is what sustains my writing. It's that I love to write, and if anything, actually, I suppose it's that um, when the writing is not going well, that's when I have to sort of say to myself, all right, you know, the world is not coming to an end. Leave it alone. Go read a book. It'll come back. And I don't know what that says about me, but... but <laughs> sure. Hi, my you can't see me, but my name is Udochi, and I am a, um, I, I'm an Igbo, obviously, writer. And I'm interested in writing science fiction, but I wanted to ask you, um, what place, <laughs> hi. hi, this is an honor by the way. Um, <laughs> I'm interested in writing science fiction and I wanted to know what place do you find that um, science fiction has in the, um, in the African uh, market? <laughs> well, I would say, um, well, two things, two things. I would say, really write what you want to write. I, I think that if it's if it's what you want to do, I don't think it should be about thinking about whether or not there's room for you in the market. There are many things that people have done not thinking there was room, and suddenly room appeared. <laughs> um, I would say read... Have you read um, um, Zahara, the, the Wind Seeker? Um, Nenna Okura from Bachu, who's Nigerian-American and who writes... Well, I suppose, I mean, there's fantasy and there's science fiction, right? I don't quite know what the boundary is because I have to say I'm not a reader of either. So, you know, I was the little girl who just had no patience for Lord of the Rings. <laughs> but my brothers loved it. I just, you know. Um, I think one of the things, and, and she's, she's an Nigerian-American and she writes, you know, she writes fantasy or science fiction, I don't know, one or the other, but, but she's done very well and has many admirers in Nigeria as well. The other thing I would say is, and I think it's very important to have a diversity of voices in the, sort of in the, in the, in the African literary scene, that we can't all be writing you know, serious, realistic fiction, right? <laughs> so I, I think it's a wonderful thing if that's what you want to do. The other thing I do have to say though is, there were many, many families in Nigeria and all across Africa actually, not just, actually in the US as well, who for religious reasons had trouble with Harry Potter. Um, and wouldn't let their kids read Harry Potter. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> I, I found it absurd, but you know. Ms. Adichie, thank you again for your time tonight. I'm sure many people congratulate you on this, so let me be amongst them. Thank you so much for talking about clinical depression and mental health in the African diaspora and Americana. I greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm sure the room is also wondering, what are your motivations when you write about mental health and what responsibilities do you feel to writing about mental health in the African diaspora? Um, well, I should start by saying that I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a sufferer of depression. I've had depression for as long as I can remember. Um, and learning later in life that this is something that's fairly common, particularly in sort of creative types, right? So I like to joke and say it's that crazy writer, creative thing that happens once in a while when you suddenly feel that, that you can't breathe. Um, I just realized that that expression has, is so loaded right now. I actually didn't, yeah. But um, I think it's important to talk about it. I think that we, I think that in, on the continent of Africa and also in the black diaspora, I think that depression is something people are dismissive of. And 
we are raised to believe that somehow it's a foreign thing. It doesn't happen to us. And I think this is a lie. I think it's a human thing that happens to everyone. I think it can manifest itself in different ways. I think that the, the ways in which the way we're socialized and our culture can, can sort of, you know, so, so that, that, that the way I experience depression is not necessarily the way somebody who lives in Australia experiences de depression, but it's still depression. And there was just a part of me that felt that we need to talk about it. I've met many young people who, who don't even have the language to talk about what they're feeling who feel silenced, who feel that um, you know, somehow it's not a legitimate thing to feel because you're not supposed to feel it. But you know you're feeling it, and so you start to feel slightly crazy because you're like, wait, I'm not supposed to, but I do, so what does it mean? Am I, do I even exist? You know, what is, what's going on in the universe? And um, so that's actually something I want to write about more. Um, just because I think it's important to talk about it. I think that when, when we name something, it's easier to to engage with it and to deal with it. And I think that depression is something that really is about managing it for the rest of one's life, really. And that um, in Nigeria, people will say things like, oh, go and pray and be happy, <laughs> right? And I, and I feel as though, but that's not what depression is actually not, not about not being happy. It's, it's a really, it's a complex thing. And so when people say, oh, be happy and go and pray, or on the other hand, when people say, but you have a very good life, and you think, but that's not, but that's not it, right? It's something that you don't have control over. And I think the other reason I wanted to um, write about it is that I think that there are many, um, there are many, so in the novel, in the way that this Nigerian American kid who's dealing with things that his mother doesn't really understand, and the way that he tries to make sense of what he's dealing with, it, it's so difficult for him. His mother, it, she loves him, but she doesn't get it. And, and for me, that's sort of, I, I think there's a part of me, I'm not sure this is true when I was writing it, but now I think about it. I think I wanted to terrify um, Nigerian parents who have Nigerian-American children. <laughs> I think I wanted, the, actually, I, not just that, I wanted to terrify all immigrant parents who raise their kids in the U.S. who don't have the experience to understand that it's very different and who dismiss it, right? So I wanted to terrify them and make them sit up and stop dismissing it. <laughs> I hope I succeeded. <laughs> Hi, thank you Hi. again for coming. I'm so excited. Uh, so this trails off really nicely from your question, actually, and thank you for asking that, because I feel like that resonates not just with African-American communities, but a lot of communities of color. I know that resonated with me, with the Indian-American community. But um, when reading your book, I thought a lot about writing creatively about a diaspora migration versus that interior reality of being either in your case, like black, African, African American, Indian American. I guess creatively, aside from those motiv motivations, when you were writing Americana, did you find yourself either identifying and or struggling with one interior reality or the other? And along with that, how did you sort of balance that over, like that sounds really weird, but balance that overlap. It's a very, I think you understand that it's, you know, you have this reality, you have the migration of your parents' reality, the immigrant parents' reality, or your experience in the past. How did you come about writing about the middle in that? And how did you, I guess, which side did you find yourself leaning towards more? I hope that makes sense. That was really winding. You look confused. I'm really sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually not sure that I understood that. I'm guessing. It made no sense. Okay, no, that's fine. You don't have to. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I think maybe what, what I would say, I mean, I, I, I'm guessing that you mean the idea of having multiple things to balance your, so I'm Nigerian, and, and then I have my story, and then there's the story of my, I don't know, I guess parents, and there's also my own internal sort of unique story. I, I guess maybe also it's really a question about whether I felt that I had to represent Nigerianness or Africanness. Yes and no, although because well, no, 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 you understand the question. That's what I'm saying, but I'm hesitant to say the last part because I feel like what a lot of people do is they read literature by people of color and say, "Oh, this is God," or not even literature but fiction, and they're like, "Oh, this is gospel." Like this defines the experience, and I don't know if that's true for everyone. Um, I guess I was just saying what's true for you. God, this is the worst question. I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> I think really all I can say is that no, I didn't feel the need. 
I don't even think about that. I think that I'm interested in telling the story that I want to tell. I think many of these concerns that you refer to, I'm not sure how many writers worry about them. I think it's a, I think it's a problem that readers have. I don't think it's a problem that comes from, from the person who creates. I think it's a problem that um, concerns the, the people who consume <laughs> what's been created. So, you know, I, I, um, and, but of course, it's, I don't want to pretend that, that there isn't a, a connection between the two because then the book comes out, people read it, and you know, the, sometimes I get irascible Nigerians saying things to me like, oh, that, you, you represented us in a very bad light, and that sort of thing, right? <laughs> And, um, but I, I mean, to put it in a very American way, I don't care. I, I, <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> so I have a process question over here. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I have, I have uh, several of my children uh, like to write, and, and they tend to start stories and never finish them, or they have three or four going on at once. So I wondered about um, your, uh, your experience. Uh, um, are you usually working mostly on one thing at a time, or do you have several different ideas going and you kind of bounce around between them, and how does that work for you? Um. Well, first thing, your children are perfectly normal. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think this is true for many writers, that you, you start and you just get stuck. I, I think, it, again, it really depends. There are stories that have taken me years to write because I start the story and then I don't know where to go with it, and I leave it alone. And then I, I start something else. So, but I, I don't necessarily do that with longer work. I don't do that with fiction. I don't do that with novels. When, I'm, when I start a novel, I, I become entirely immersed in it. What does happen is that there are moments when I get stuck within the novel, and I sort of take time off, and then I come back and hope that it comes back. I think um, that writing, to, that starting something doesn't necessarily mean that one is meant to finish it. But it can actually be... It can actually be, and I have found this in my own work, that it can be a way of writing out the crap so that you can actually, sorry, am I, can I use that word? <laughs> so I, I don't think, I suppose I, I'm just saying I don't think it's necessarily in the creative process that I don't think it's necessarily negative. I think that many writers have that. They, they start and they, they just can't finish. And you know, a year later they might or they might not. And it's, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Jacqueline. Um, I'm here with some people from my English class and my teacher, Ms. Twos. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and on behalf of all of us, I want to say thank you for bringing um, such a fresh and new, um, well, no, it's a it's pr perspective that's always existed, but thank you for um, bringing it to our classroom, at least. <laughs> we just read the thing. Thank you. Know. Thank you for your uh, cool hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my question to you is, um, have you ever felt pressure to, like, um, make your perspective more like mainstream or like lose your um, your voice as like an African person, uh, an African woman in America? No. <laughs> Here's the, <laughs> I, I haven't, I mean, I, the, the person who will make me do that has not been born. <laughs> but you know, actually, I mean, it's interesting, it's an interesting question because, and also a valid one because this reminds me of a question I, I got from a very well-meaning young man who said to me, I went to speak at a school somewhere um, in the Midwest, and this very earnest young man said to me, well, do you, know, do you plan to always write about Nigeria, or will you write about normal things? <laughs> and, and, you know, for him, I mean, and again, this was a question from, it, it, didn't, it wasn't malicious, right? It came from that idea, and it's it's an idea that I think is is um, you know when you're when you're born and raised in a particular way in a particular part of the world, you think that your reality is the only reality that is valid. And so, for this young man, my writing about Nigeria was just this rare, exotic, strange thing, and he was very keen to know if I would come around finally to doing what was normal. <laughs> and, and I just remember. You know, being struck by that, and you know, I said to him, "Well, you have made me realize that Nigeria is not normal because I, I thought it was. <laughs> I, apparently, it's not. But, but questions like that, and I think that um, 
that the other people think and say things that are kind of, you know, because again, there's the idea that there's a mainstream and that you don't fit and, but that's, I, 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 I can't even, I can only be what I am and this is who I am. And I also believe very firmly that, um, that my story is worth telling. So yeah, I'm going to keep doing the abnormal. <laughs> Happily. <laughs> Hi, Chimamanda. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank I am you. actually half Nigerian and half Ghanaian, and I'm very, very fascinated by your name. I would love to know how to pronounce the full name correctly, and also if you'd be kind enough to explain what your name actually means. <laughs> All right, I have to tell you, which half do you have more? Um, <laughs> be careful what you say. The, no, it, seriously, it, it's awful because when I go to Nigeria, they tell me I belong to Ghana because Ghanaians practice uh, matrilineal inheritance, and my mother is from Nigeria. But when I come to Ghana, uh, when I go to Ghana, they tell me, "Oh no, you belong to you know." It's <laughs> vice. What what should I have said? I think I should have said the opposite, right? In, <laughs> in Ghana, it's matrilineal, so right. you belong to your mother's side. My father is from Ghana, so uh. traditionally, I don't belong to Ghana. But according to the Yorubas, I belong to my father yeah. because they, you know, practice the patrilineal, so whatever. But my parents... <laughs> My parents are really cool. They don't mind, you know, one Muslim, one Christian, nobody cares. So. Fantastic. <laughs> but I, I really am fascinated um, by your name, and I wish, I would really like to understand some of the Igbo words. I've been asking people, but if you would kindly explain your name, I would really love that. Sure. So about the, the reason that, the reason that um, all of my work, I write mostly about characters who, like me, are Igbo speakers and who, like me, have two languages who are the, the, that they consider their first languages. So I consider Igbo and English my first languages. Both are mine. Um, I speak both very well, often at the same time, often in the same sentence <laughs> with family. And because of that, I tried very hard, and I, and I, con I think I, I will continue to do that, to, to just to capture that essence in my work, to, to try and get the reader to understand that these are people who, in one sentence, might actually speak English and Igbo in one sentence. Um, when I started writing my, my first novel that was published here, I had a bit of trouble with my editor who thought that I would confuse Americans. And it's funny because shortly after that I was reading, I, now I don't remember which one of um, Saul Bellow's books, but he, uh, maybe Herzog, I don't, I don't remember which one, but he has reams of French on translate, nothing, just, you know, so there are bits, so there's French and then back to English, the character speaks French and we get the full French. I don't mean bits, I mean we get the full French. <laughs> and so I said to her, well, you know, if it's a question of confusing readers with a language that isn't English, then surely Saul Bellow's work would not have been published because, you know, we would have had him have a very lengthy glossary at the back to make it all exotic. So I, I guess my point was that for her to say, don't put, those, don't put the African language, um, was really also about value judgments. It was about which languages get to be in a book and be okay and which don't. So French is fine, the bits of Italian, right? So usually you'll sort of read the romance books where the man says, you know, amore, I want you to come to me. And she says, you know, that sort of thing. And it's fine, but then it will becomes a problem for some people. So which is why, but, but the other reason, actually, the real reason deep in my heart is that I want, to, I want everybody to speak Igbo in the world. So, <laughs> so this is the plot, but uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. My name, my name means, um, the literal translation is my God will not fall down. Chi in Igbo, in Igbo, in Igbo, Igbo cosmology, the Chi really means the, the personal spirit. The, so each person has a Chi. But then when Christianity came at the turn of the century, she then became God, became the Christian God, right? So Chimamanda means my God will not fall down. Chimamanda. Yeah. Ngozi um, is a very common Igbo name. Um, it means blessing. It's actually a short, the, the full name is Ngozi Chukuka. And it means God's blessing is the greatest. Um, thank you for being here today, despite of what happened to your family. Our thoughts and prayers are with them. Thank you. Um, it's, it's good that you talked about faith. Um, 
issues around African belief or unbelief are very intriguing to me. And I think uh, one storyline that came out from Americana was when Ifemelu, she seemed to have this roll my eyes attitude towards faith or issues of faith, specifically when her mother would um, say something like, pray about it to that effect. Was that just you, um, one storyline, or was it you tapping into this larger um, narrative of be it millennials and their distance from religion and faith, or um, tapping into what has shaped the African belief system and mm. re religiosity? You know what, I, don't, I actually don't know that I necessarily agree with the, the idea that millennials, I suppose we should talk about which millennials. Nigerian millennials are not separated from religion. Nigerian millennials are very religious. Okay. It's an interesting kind of religiosity, right. but, but they are. Um, I think it's, I mean, I think I should say that just as a general, I mean, Ife Melo is a character and that's what she feels. And, and I think it, it comes from the fact that she grows up with a mother who is just oppressively religious. And in a way that Ife Melo thinks just finds hypocritical. So you have um, her, her, uh, her auntie Uju, who is in a relationship with a married man who you know, pays for things, and her mother says, oh, God sent them. And to Ifemelo, it's just this incredible hypocrisy because she thinks, well, why do we have to pretend in the name? You know, why do we have to use God? And so I, I just find myself in general and this is a position I, I feel very strongly about. There's a kind of religiosity in Nigeria that I find very dangerous. And it's something that has, it's a kind of, um, it's not sort of orthodox Christianity, so it's not sort of the old fashioned Anglican and Catholic churches, it's the new wave um, prosperity Pentecostalism that started really in Nigeria in the, I would say the late 1980s and has taken over things. And I think the reason I find it very dangerous and the reason that I don't think I'm ever going to write a character who's sympathetic to it because I don't know how to, is that it's, it, it has serious consequences. People, you know, people steal money and say, Jesus is Lord, God blessed me. Um, people will cheat and attribute it to God. Um, and, and even worse than that, people will not study for an exam Right, and then say God will help me, and then you think, well, but God gave you a brain <laughs> to use it. But I think even more people will get sick and not go to hospital. Um, and, and actually, more re I very recently heard in Lagos somebody say, "I am strong." What they meant was they were unwell, but because of this idea of confessing positively, this person wrote to her boss and said, "I can't come to work because I'm feeling strong." Now her boss, who was not Nigerian, thought this was a joke and was very upset, right? And so it took Nigerians saying, well, no, this is actually this person saying I'm not well, but because this person is you know, Christian in a certain way, you're supposed to confess positively. So in some ways, I think that it just starts to um, get in the way of a certain kind of rationality. And it worries me because it has consequences for everything, our economy, everything. Um, I think that in general, faith can be an incredible force for good. I don't think it always is. I think it can be. The kind of religiosity that's happening in Nigeria now worries me very much. I don't see, you know, the, the, you read about sort of just really beautiful things like um, the way that certain orders of the Catholic Church, for example, uh, are very socially engaged, right? And so where the idea of inequalities is an important religious subject, right? And I think it should be. Because, you know, if we sort of look at the Bible, Jesus was rather keen on people who didn't have very much. But the kind of, the kind of Christianity that's very popular in Nigeria now is the kind that equates wealth with, with blessing. It, it equates wealth with some, so, so then I find myself constantly asking, well, but so what are we saying about poverty? Somehow it's that people, is it your fault? I mean, have you somehow lost? contact with God if you're poor, but you haven't. We know why they're poor, because our society is messed up. There are things that we can actually do to fix it. And so anyway, I don't want to ramble, because don't get me started on certain kinds of Pentecostal <laughs> prosperity, preaching um, 
uh, yeah, I mean, there are people who've said to me, oh, you could have had one person who was Pentecostal and, and portrayed positively. That, that's not my job. Ifemel is a character who doesn't think positively about that. And, and I think it's also important to, um, to realize that it's not an all-encompassing attack on faith. I think that faith can be a powerful good. I mean, my, I grew up, um, go, just to go back to my father, my father, is, um, my father is a believer, my father is a Christian, my father is Catholic, and I think that his faith is one of the most beautiful things about him because it's a kind of abiding, quiet, just a very beautiful force. Um, and it certainly does not make him think that he should be rich, right? Nor does it make him judgmental of people who have not done well, right? Which I think is what happens in many of the mainstream, the kind of church that Ifemela's mother goes to is the kind of church I have trouble with. We have time for two more questions. Okay. Sorry, I shouldn't have gone on for so long. Um, first of all, I want to thank you not only for being here, but just for writing the book. Um, my mom migrated from Nigeria in her 20s, so the book was really cool as a reflection of her experience and me understanding that more and then also seeing myself in that. Um, so my question, ever since my first date with my boyfriend, we've been trying to figure out in the plot if it's Obinze or Kurt who anonymously um, donates to a family lose blog. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> can we um, can we get a question from this side? Yeah, I'll I'll take it really quickly. I promise. I'll be very. Uh, yeah, no, no, go on. I'll be very quick. I promise. All right. Good evening. Um, my question is in regards to programs like Farafina and Kwani. Um, the question is, is there deliberately space being made for the diasporic African narrative? And if so, are those spaces being filled? Are we meeting you guys halfway, getting across the pond? So, <laughs> that's my question. Yes. Um, well, my vision for the, the workshop I teach in Nigeria every summer is that, for me, that my vision is Pan-African. But of course, because I'm a bit of a Nigerian crazy nationalist, you know, <laughs> it, it, more Nigerians, but, you know, Pan-African. Um, and, and for me, my definition of Pan-African doesn't just stop in the continent. Um, for me, Pan-African means people of African descent. And so two years ago, actually, we had, we had an African-American woman come to the workshop. Um, and we've had, right, okay, so we've had Nigerian-Americans as well. But so we've, we've had, a, we had uh, an African-American come about two years ago, and she, and it was her first time in, in um, not just in Nigeria, but in Africa, and she clearly fell in love with the place and maybe with someone I don't know. Um, <laughs> So no, we're, it really were open. People, people apply to the workshop from, from all over the place. And last year, I was struck by how many applications we got from India. Yeah, and um, which I just thought was lovely. And so maybe I'm sort of thinking, how can we then get India to be part of the African diaspora? Let's, <laughs> we'll work something out. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I love you so much. It's like, <laughs> it's, like, uh, it's like unreal that I'm this close to you, but at a distance. Um, we've... <laughs> I've read your writing and I've read all about your achievements, but I wanted to know what your greatest obstacle has been. Hmm. I don't know that I have a greatest obstacle. I think that, um, I mean, writing is such a, when I started writing, I feel very grateful to be here and to have your love that I actually, you know, you, you, if you see the dark parts of me, you won't love me. But, um, <laughs> so I feel very grateful about that, but right, and, and I, I just, it's, it's still, for, I haven't lost my sense of wonder. And I, I keep saying to my friends, when I lose it, kill me. Because I don't want to lose my sense of wonder about that you write something that matters to you and then it means something to somebody else. You know, there's something very beautiful about it. But if I didn't get this fortunate, I would still be writing. Because for me, the writing is a thing that I love. And, and they're two very different things. The writing and then the publishing and what happens afterwards. Of course, you hope that both happen. But you don't, you're not sure. And so for me, the, when I think about obstacles, I think about me sitting in front of my computer and the writing is not going well, and I'm just not in a good place. And how do I overcome that? I, you know, I read or I, I do whatever, and I shop online, and I, <laughs> I, I watch um, YouTube videos of women doing their hair, natural hair. <laughs> okay, can we, have, we haven't talked about that, we have to. Can I just talk about... <laughs> 
it is such a wonderful, I just find it, I find it an incredible subculture of just a fascinating thing that should be studied by social scientists. But I, I do that. So I think I would say that my obstacles are actually in some ways quite interior. There's sort of that struggle with the creative process. That's, that's what it's been for me. But there are other things like dealing with um, when success happens, it comes with its own bullshit, right? So you have to deal with certain things, and, and I don't always enjoy that. So on the one hand, I feel very grateful for having readers. And on the other hand, there are times I don't want to. I don't want to have to be a public person because it just comes with certain things that are not always fun. The book. <laughs> Um, thank you for coming. I'm so excited to see you, I'm sure, like everyone else. Um, and one thing I really appreciate about you and your work is that you speak up for equality, gender equality in particular, and your speech, which, you know, as was mentioned before, um, Beyonce also adopted. Um, <laughs> that speech was actually really helpful for me to show my dad, who is wonderful, and he, you know, believes that girls can do whatever guys can do, but, you know, whenever, you know, I say I'm a feminist, like, eh, no, don't, those two people, you know, but then I, yeah. I got her to watch your, yeah. watch your speech, and then it was, you were able to articulate some, some of the things that I wasn't able to articulate to him, and I really appreciated that. Um, and now, as I have qu um, conversations with my friends, you know, there's this new men's rights movement that is very difficult to, like, you know, maneuver around without also insulting the the men who are for gender equality who just don't, you know, really understand the debate. So I was wondering what your take was. Wait, I, I want to understand. So you think that the men's rights movement is about men who don't understand? No, the, oh, I don't. But okay. it's the, some of the men who, you know, sympathize with this men's movement yeah. are also not, you know, they're not misogynist. They just, yeah. that's what, so yeah, I'm yeah, asking yeah, for yeah. your take. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting. No, it's, it's actually very interesting. I, I find it a... I think that all, um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've, been read, I've read a bit about the men's rights movement, and I, I do feel a bit icky about people who are sympathetic to them, <laughs> right? Um, because I think that it's the, the premise of that movement is that somehow the people who are not the victims are the victims. And the problem with that, I think, is that it's a kind of willful blindness. It's a kind of, you know, I'm not even going to hear what you're saying. I'm actually the one that's hurting here. <laughs> and, and I think it happens, but I, I think it's not just limited to gender. I think it happens, I think it's the same way that, the, that there is an, in the US, I think, a deep um, kind of sense of agree, being aggrieved among certain white Americans who think that they are the ones who have suffered from all of this race thing. Because now, you know, there's that, right? Which is why there are people who... Um, you know, the reason I, I, was, I was clapping happily when I heard her say Black Lives Matter is because, it, because I was hoping I wouldn't hear all lives matter. Yes. Right. And in some ways, all lives matter is, you can draw a parallel with that and men's rights movements because, because to say Black Lives Matter is actually all lives matter. But the, the point, of course, is which lives don't quite matter right now. That's what we need to focus on, right? <laughs> and, and so I think... Um, so I think for, for you know, the men's rights movement, I mean, on the one hand, I think that there's certain, and maybe those are the people you're referring to there, I, I think there are many good men in the world. I think that there are some who just don't get it. <laughs> because when you're living in a certain kind of privilege, you, you don't get it, not because you're evil or malicious, but because you haven't had any reason to get it. And so in, in my talk, when I talk about my friend Louis, who, by the way, has become famous because of that talk. So he's got some, <laughs> and he's just a really, he's a really lovely guy. And for so long, he just didn't understand why I, I, I would talk about gender being a problem. And then suddenly this thing happens where this man who I gave money to, my money from my purse, said, thank you, sir, to him and ignored me. <laughs> and Louis suddenly thinks, wait, why did he thank me? And I said, well, because you have the dangling organ. That's why, <laughs> right? So, so... And, and so suddenly for him, it was sort of this thing. He suddenly saw it and he found it really odd. So I think, I mean, the men's rights movement, you know, maybe what I can say is I'm just never going to donate to any men's <laughs> rights movement groups, right? But I also be I believe very much in dialogue. And I think that, um, that, that that should be more dialogue. I think that often the problem with talking about gender and also race is that it starts off being so polarized, right? So there, there's very little room for sort of, 
right? And, and I find that when I have spoken to some men who, who before didn't quite get it, I mean, the Nigerian men who've listened to the talk and said, you know, I started thinking about it. And the Nigerian men who've said to me, I didn't notice until I listened to your talk that I would go to a restaurant with my wife or my girlfriend or my female friend and, and I, would, I would be spoken to and they would be ignored. And they said they didn't really notice until they listened to the talk. And, and some of them now say things like, oh, I say to them, no, 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 you need to be polite to her. Right? And I think that's progress. So I... I mean, I, I suppose I would like to be in dialogue with the men's rights movement. I don't know. But um, I, I think that dialogue is very important. And I'm, I'm very much a believer in that, that it's possible for people to, I think it's possible for us to understand one another. There are always going to be people on the fringes who just you will never get to, but that's fine. But, but I, I think that, um, yeah, I think, and, and for me, to talk about feminism, I don't think feminism is the exclusive preserve of females. I think feminism is human. I think I, I when people say they're not feminist, I think, well, how can you not be? <laughs> and how can you not stand for justice? Um, but I think part of it is, is because of what your father said, which is that, that f the word feminist and the idea of it sometimes can be a part. So people think feminist means you know, all kinds of you know, angry women who are hairy, that kind of nonsense. Um, <laughs> By the way, angry women who are hairy are very cool, I think, right? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I think the idea that feminist has, has, has so many sort of, is so loaded, and part of the reason I, I wanted to give that talk and that I, I, I keep wanting to talk about gender is to demystify that word feminism, that, that we need to take it back. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I won't, yeah. I'll, all right, two more, two okay. more, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, again, I love your writing, and um, this book is a book clearly about race, about uh, class, but it's also a love story. Yes. And um, I have a question related to that in terms of the writing process, your writing process. A lot of authors talk about the fact whether they know a story when they start a story. You said you stop. Sometimes you get st stuck, and you have to spend some time getting it going again. Do you know when you start a story at the beginning, do you know what the end is? Do you have in your mind what you want the end to be? And I ask that because in this book, towards the end, it seems very clear that Ifibulu and Abinze are not going to be together. He's made the choice to go back to his family. And you're like, oh, that's the end of the story. But then comes back, and there he is. So I, I wasn't sure whether you had an ending. And we don't, we don't want to give things it. away just in case somebody has. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say that thing that happens at the end, right? <laughs> but you know, that's, a, that's interesting because there are two, when you say, do I know, and do I, um, do I know what I want it to be, which I think are kind of different, and, and the answer is no. I kind of vaguely know what I want it to be, but, but I never quite know. And so I'll tell you, for example, about um, my previous novel, Half of the Yellow Sun, which you know, is set during Nigeria's um, war. And I kind of, when I was writing it, I, um, I knew something bad would happen to one of the characters. I mean, you, know, you, you can't write a book about Biafra and have it be happy. But the person who I thought, the character that I thought something bad would happen to ended up not being the character that something bad happened to, if that makes sense. And I don't know how to articulate it in a sort of, it, I don't know how to intellectualize it. It just happened. It, it, the character refused to have something bad happen to that character. <laughs> this is true. I know it sounds crazy. And so in this, in this I, you know, the, I, I was going on, I was actually enjoying writing the, the love bits. And... I think I was getting to the end and I realized that these characters were just not doing what I wanted them to do. And I don't know if this is true or if I'm making this up after the fact, but I think I forced them. So I, the book was coming to an end and they were not doing what I wanted. So I think I said, all right, I'm stepping in. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> because I started off wanting to write a traditional love story. I mean, I sort of... I read many romances when I was um, a teenager. I don't know how much damage that has done to me, but <laughs> probably a lot. And I wanted to write a traditional love story in a, in a sense, but I also wanted to remake it. I wanted to write, write a love story where the woman had agency right? and where it wasn't just about, you know, she, doesn't, she loves the man, but then they hate each other, and then he pulls her, and then she goes, oh, and melts against him, that sort of thing. <laughs> so I wanted her to have agency. And, but then the thing about love stories is that they have to end in a particular way, right? And, and this wasn't working out, so I thought I have to step in and make this the traditional love story. So. Just based on the theme of Black Lives Matter and what's going on in society right now with the black community and how it's being handled in the police, what do you think about that? Is that a good 
Uh, where to start? I mean, you know what I can say is that, um, and I've, I've been spending a lot more time in Nigeria now than I did, say, in, in you know, five years ago, for example. And there's something that is startling about... So when, um, when a man who was running away was shot in the back, I was in Lagos and I watched it online, and there's something very stark. I think that when you're in a society where these things happen, it's not that you become numb to it, but it's that there's a certain... It's, almost, it's not quite that you expect it, but that... You, it's not, I, I don't, I found that watching it in Nigeria was just so much more startling and so much more horrifying for me. Right? And, um, I, I, you know, what, what is there to say really? I suppose I, I do have to say that I, I have immense admiration for, for what seems to me a kind of, of deeply felt movement that's happening. I think, and people have said, oh, you know, racism is increasing. I don't think it is. I think that it's something that just, we ignored. I, I think we just didn't have cell phones, right? <laughs> and now there's cell phones, and um, and also people. I think I think that they're just people who've had enough and who. Um, so my plan, actually, my husband and I, we wanted to. We uh, we're going to join the Baltimore, and go walk and and. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, and it's. I, I think I think that if it's I, you know it's the, it's the least one can do, and I think. You know, I just think that it has to stop. I mean, I think it just has to stop. And, and, and also, for me, as a person who, who's a storyteller and who thinks about people as individuals, I'm also very curious about what it is about the society that has made people who are human and who are ostensibly kind people, who love and who are loved, what is it that makes them look at one human being and not see that human being as fully human? What is it about the society that has made that happen? That's what we need to think about, I think. Right? Because, um, because I think it's too easy to demonize and say, all of these policemen are devils. Right? They're not. They're not. They're people who love them. They love people. They're, prob they're kind. They, they, you know, they go to church. They're... And, then, and, and then another human being is dead or dying. And there isn't any connection, no empathy, nothing. And America has done that. And so we, it's, for me, it's a question of, well, it's not just a question of, oh, we need to clean up the police force. We also need to think about what this society is teaching people about who's, 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 who's fully human, who's worthy of being considered fully human, I think. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I just want to say thank you for coming here. Um, this book uh, helped me a lot in terms of I, I read it. I started. I bought the book in London the first day that I started this solo trip journey for seven months in, in Europe and Africa. And I felt like if I made those strong character transfer over because I was feeling pretty scared. <laughs> and um, I guess my question kind of was like uh, what the lady said before on like beginning of the book. Do you know how the end, how it ends? But when you start writing it, and do you know how it was going to end? Because I feel like those three words were like the most perfect ending ever. But is there something else for Ifemel? Like, uh, <laughs> will we have another short story or something like that to know <laughs> what happens? <laughs> I don't know. I um, last I heard, I think she's happy and doing okay. <laughs> But here's, here's the thing that interests me. I mean, actually, you know, it's interesting. I thought you were going to... So when the book first came out, I would do these events, and many, many women would say to me, all right, well, I need to ask you, can I have Ubinza's phone number? <laughs> right? So I thought... I wanted to know if you wanted his phone number. No, I'm just kidding. He's, he's taken. Thank you so much. <laughs>